Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 156, Gumption. Now there are particular words, there are particular words that sort of freak me out, sort of weak hippie words, like resilience, like closure, like the work and life balance sad hippie words but there was one word in this single word vlog series that i wanted to summon and use and that word is gumption and so for the last month or so i've been thinking oh, i want to use that word i love that word it's an active powerful engaging word and yet i didn't have any content in or around it and then something really synergetic and magical happened an amazing opportunity for me an amazing opportunity for this vlog series and yes an incredible opportunity for you to meet an astounding person dr debbie hindley is visiting south australia and visiting adelaide you arrived yesterday yes and so she is here and just she was coming she said she was coming i'm so excited and i said would you do a vlog and she said yes so if you want inspiration if you want an ability or a capacity to kick on, to motivate, to show some courage, to take that jump in your life, then you might find that momentum, that gumption today. So gumption is here, gumption is sitting next to me. So we are in the brick and mortar creative hub in Adelaide. How posh is this, Deb? Very posh. Um, so of course, th there's a few meetings occurring with men being very definitive and clear and staunch and whatever men do around tables on Sunday mornings, they're doing it. But the two of us are together to do something rather powerful. Now, Dr. Debbie Hindley has had an incredibly successful career. It's had many phases and many modes and tropes. Currently, she's the Policy Officer for Strategy, Planning and Performance at the University of Western Australia. Now, she's held a range of posts as a professional staff member and as an academic in universities, but also a series of roles in both the public and the private sector, including the cultural history consultant for the Bounce Down exhibition, uh, which was women's Australian Rules football exhibition, and it was the centenary, wasn't it? 19, 1915 to 2015. She's also engaged in multiple research projects involving the First World War and the Second World War, and particularly GLAM engagement, gallery, libraries, archives, and museums engagement with the 20th century wars. She completed her PhD at Murdoch University over a decade ago. And her book, In the Outer, Not on the Outer, was published in 2008. And it remains the definitive book on women and Australian rules football. Deb, welcome to South Australia. Thank you very much, Tara. Uh, and welcome to the vlog series. This is, we're both quite emotional, I can hear it in our voices. It's a, it's a full circle moment for me, certainly. And it is a privilege to see you, as you may have worked out, I supervise Deb and uh, the best students teach us but the best students go on to change the world and change our way of thinking and Debbie has certainly done that. So Deb I want to take you back if I can way over a decade ago when you were a professional staff member. For my colleagues around the world Debbie was an administrator in a university but can I say a very senior and successful woman. You were the highest officer for an executive dean at an Australian university. So I just want to take you back there. So why did you think from that position of profound success as a woman in leadership that you wanted to complete a PhD? I've always loved learning uh, and I continue to be the lifelong learner. Uh, I'm going through a, a series of uh, micro-credential courses at the moment, so I, um, I've always been the lifelong learner. I wanted some, I've also always loved research, so whatever job I've held right back from in my early 20s, um, I've always found some element of research that I could um, find, explore and produce results. And this, and doing a PhD was a way of extending my um, research expertise and getting credentials for it. 
at that particular time, the family were all interested in um, and involved with Australian rules football, and we were members of the West Coast Eagles, and. I saw the, um, that the participation of women around the ground uh, and the enthusiasm and the passion was as equal, if not more, than the men. Yes. Um, I also knew that this was not necessarily the case in other countries. I'd been to, um, lived in London for a short time in the, um, late 1970s and I wanted to go to a football match and my friend said to me, no you can't, women don't go to football over there and I said, well they do at home, they don't here uh, and I, I went and yes it was, um, I must have been about the only woman in that stadium then. And, and certainly in the pre-stadium, the seated stadium, so the pre-Hillsborough days, uh, you have to be quite staunch and physically aware to maintain, particularly in the stadium where we've got crowd swaying and so forth. Crowd management's quite complex yes. in association football. We were, we were sort of in corrals and I was very close to him and it was, the, the physicality was more off the field than it was on the field. So, but, yeah. so that was, you had that fantastic moment. This is a great way into research for a lot of you out there. So you saw a problem or a challenge in that women were, and was the, the Adelaide Crows, wasn't it, they had over 50% yes. of its members yes. as women. And yes. so it's funny that we're in Adelaide, you and I, doing this, having this conversation. But you were aware women's participation in the AFL was very, very high in multiple roles, and yet they were invisible in the research and the policy. Yes, yes they were. They, and um, there were prominent women coming up, but still there was no real mention. Dixie Marshall... Um, she was one of the first um, commentators um, and there was just this very slow um, inclusion of women but still it, the inclusion came from them wanting to be involved um, and the AFL um, management still hadn't realised um, what was um, what was happening? That the you know the social um, change was happening, and that women wanted to have um, a greater participation in the AFL in a diversity of roles beyond a diverse, yes. beyond the fan and beyond the girlfriend, the wag yes. of the footballer. Yes. And your thesis captured that magnificently. So I want to go into that if I can. Tell us about the PhD which then went on to become the book. For me, looking back on it again, and I read the book again yesterday, what what makes it so incredible, Deb, is that you captured the diversity of roles of women and that diversity was simply beyond belief. So do you want to talk a little bit about what, what the thesis did and then what the, this great book did? Well, um, the thesis looked at the range of women's participation from um, the mothers, uh, who support um, their their sons at that stage um, from you know uh, the junior leagues um, from um, as soon as they can hold the football you know cutting up the oranges doing the administrative work all of that right through until um, uh, uh, Eagle's um, mother told me that when her son was um, injured it was her that was taking the son for his um, medical appointments and all of that. So the women were um, far more engaged at all levels there. Um, then we've got the administrators, again, support role. Um, and just about that time, um, uh, there had been the first woman appointed to the um, AFL um, the, as the commissioner, as a commissioner, AFL commissioner. And I also started to um, notice that there were a number of um, professional women getting involved with through physiotherapy, yes. through um, dietary, you know, That's studies. Right. Um, the, the referees started to come into just at that yes. point. So yep. women referees 
yeah. yeah, and how they and there was that structural problem at the start, wasn't there, Deb, where they let them do the reserves yes. or they let them do the colts, yes. just in case, of course, women make a mistake. They also weren't quite happy for them to. They started oh, as the goal, yes. the goal refs, didn't they? Yes, yes, they did. Um, there was the um, goal umpires um, and then the boundary umpires. That was in um, AFL. In the lower, um, the lower tier leagues, um, women were becoming umpires there. There were problems there with um, the inclusion and the acceptance of women as, as umpires. Uh, strangely enough, it, it actually, um, the resistance there were, was from the, the women who were um, the wives and girlfriends of the players. They could not understand from their perspective being a partner why another woman would want to um, be involved in this then very male dominated um, space. But, so. but I mean you did a profound job because you captured the, the deep and wide sociology of women throughout all levels of the sport, the different modes, I mean it was just absolutely stunning. And spectators too, and spectators and, and really I think perhaps um, that's one of the richest areas there and one where I saw diversity as well because there were, um, I had um, Indigenous um, women um, who gave me um, research, um, were a mine of research material. Um, I had um, women, I had a woman who had been a um, Singaporean businesswoman who ne then lived in um, Australia. She she was so passionate about the Eagles, and she actually found that um, her fandom actually gave her a way into um, conversations with Australian men that she wouldn't have had otherwise had she not had the interest and the passion in AFL. And Deb's thesis and this fantastic book, which I do recommend to you, did so many things. One of the great things she did was she created a brand new way of thinking about fandom. She took a lot of Steve Redhead's work, took a lot of that theorisation of fandom that did work in association football, lesser extent perhaps in rugby league, but was able to translate a really innovative, edgy mode of fandom and you know it was transformative for fan studies in this country. That's how important this thesis is. The, the next question, Debbie, is about you. Looking back on it now over a decade, what, what did that PhD do for you as a woman, as a scholar, as a researcher, but also as a worker? Um, as, a, as a woman, as a person, um, it, firstly, it, it broadened my um, circle of people that I know and I've met wonderful friends and they're wonderful parents. Yeah. Hello Doris and Kevin. Hello Doris and Kevin. Um, so that circle grew bigger and so and maintained to this day too. That yes. Deb was, I'll just put in the footnote here, Deb was part of my first very large cohort of PhD students. Yeah, basically 18 students did a PhD in about a five year period. So it became a family and, and an incredibly successful family. They all finished and finished quickly. And most of you still know each other to this day. So when you can be part of a special little microclimate yes. like that, mm -hmm. take that opportunity. It, it, that might be the only time it happens in my career. Yes, but, yeah. yes. certainly I um, refer to them as the, um, the Murdoch cohort or the Murdoch gang. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, as a worker, well, it's given me the opportunity to um, apply for jobs that were, would not have been available if I had stayed in that um, safe position, I could have still been there in that safe position, but this gave me the opportunity to um, work at um, in different roles and um, mainly still research, um, even in the, the, the policy team, a lot of our work is research based, It is. Um, so because we need to uh, find evidence to build strong policies, um, so it's as a worker. But also, so that's finding the positions. But once there, I've got a, a whole range of skills now. And 
skills in to do with research, with writing, with presentation, um, with actually being able to think. Yeah, you know, the critical skills, the critical thinking skills have really been developed. And um, I'm not prepared these days to just accept something on face value or to accept that something is because it is or I question. I question and um, another area is because you have to go when you're um, doing your thesis and if you have any component of human research, around, you have to go through the Human Research Ethics Committee. So I would like to think that I have brought that, that awareness of um, ethical behaviour into my own work. Wow. So what what I do, you know, I think eth ethically based. So see that, that I didn't. We've never. I've never asked her that question before. But Deb has having the doctorate. So Dr. Debbie Hindley has holding that PhD been advantageous for you to think moving through the diversity of these roles in the last 10, 12 years. As a woman, has it made a difference in terms of your credibility or your traction through work? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, see, when when you're thinking of yourself, and I, I even though I think of you know gender politics a lot, um, I don't sort of distinguish. How would I be if I was a male? No, I, don't, I, I, I think there are certain you bring certain skills as a woman, um, and you develop that maybe that ethical side. Yeah. And that communication side, you've got that. Yes, I think I think it has actually advantage. Um, because different. Because the skill base would be taken for granted. The argument, perhaps, is that women have to credential. You could be assumed that a man is competent. Yes. Yes. Whereas, whereas, because you've got that doctorate, yes. you finished it incredibly quickly. It's been incredibly successful. Yes. It, people could could treat you perhaps with greater respect. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and um, and that's not good either, by the way. Um, you know, in my um, in that safe, comfortable space where I was before, I would see people who were credentialed and who were getting, um, uh, you know, they were in really responsible positions and yet I felt that had I the same opportunity or the same credentials that I would be um, regarded the same, with the same... Um, those doors would open. Those doors would open, yes. That, that's only what you said to yeah. me at the time, so yeah. it is interesting reflecting back on it, yes. you know, telescoping that, that has come to pass. Yes, yes it has. Remarkable. Yeah. Yes. Now, let's let's just go one more stage with the women and the AFL issue, because you like the best of PhD students, and it's a real model for the wonderful students around the world watching this. You were ahead of the curve, you were ahead of the game, like a decade ahead. So you saw a social problem and you went for it to create that original contribution to knowledge. Yes. But yes. Deb, tell us about what happened to you, what happened to that research uh, as the women's AFL competition was being created. So here is the person who did the PhD on this area. How was it used? What happened, Deb, in the last eight years? The, there's the AFLW. Uh, so um, not long after I had um, completed my PhD, had been submitted and passed, um, I was contacted by um, a woman who'd been employed by the um, WA Football Commission to develop um, women and girls football in Western Australia. So we had a number of incredibly uh, long meetings and um, I freely shared, and this is something that I actually believe in, that you freely share um, your, your work. There's no point in it being bundled up in a uh, and no one accessing it. That's it's not the reason that you do these sorts of things. Mm. And she went on to work for the, the AFL, and not long after, the um, the plans were put in place for the AFLW. So I am I I feel in, incredibly um, happy and privileged that the AFLW can be a measurable social um, impact. 
you know, you can actually measure that what my um, thesis has um, achieved. So that, you know, there's a direct line between me, well, yes, there's a direct line between me and the AFLW. I won't say that I did it all, I wouldn't claim that, but I certainly, my input was important at those early stages of the development of the Women's League. Because the research had already been done, so the AFL didn't have to pay for it, there it was. So that's a pretty interesting impact and engagement story, isn't it, Deb? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Incredible. Now let's, let's go post-PhD, so we're dealing with about the last 10 years or so. You've moved between professional high-level administrative and academic roles in a really interesting way. It's a great model, I think, for our students. And for example, your current post, like so many of your roles, are almost this sort of combination of high-level professional expertise and high-level academic skills. So tell us about moving into these sorts of positions and what do you find are the advantage of these sorts of positions? People may not consider them, so Deb's working in very high level policy engagement at UWA right now. Tell us about these sorts of roles for, for our students. Well, the, uh, the policy team um, are involved in creating a, a strong policy library for UWA and we work with our stakeholders um, to produce these really strong, robust policies. And we, we want to engage our, our stakeholders. They are the people that are going to use the policy in their everyday job. So we have um, a, a framework that we work to and there are um, nine phases of um, developing a, a policy fr right from the initial brief and we go through um, the initial brief that is, yes, go ahead, have a look at this. We put up a project plan. So the, the, the initial brief is to say, yes, go ahead. Then there's the project plan. And then you go through research and consultation. And you go through drafting. And included in the drafting is looking at um, peer institutions international institutions. So benchmarking? Yes, um, looking um, at what problems they may have encountered. So you actually, you're building up a body of, of evidence of why the policy should be written a certain way. Um, and along with that you have accompanying um, procedures and guidelines. So the end product is um, it applies to the university as the institution, it may apply to the um, university community mm. or it might specifically involve a certain group of people. Yes. But um, this is evidence-based work at its best. And also what I'm loving is it's also incredibly diverse, so I'd imagine one day is not like the next. No. And, you know, in research we spend a lot of time thinking about who our audience is, what are the outcomes. All that expertise, that mapping, is part of what you're doing yes. on a daily basis. Yes, yeah, the mapping is really important. Um, getting um, the... The people who are using the policy are also the, um, the, they have the expert knowledge. So if you want to actually look at a policy the way you would look at um, um, doing a PhD thesis, you, you have your literary review, you go and um, gather your, um, your ethno, um, ethnographic work by talking to the um, stakeholders, then you get further evidence and then you produce your recommendations, um, produce the policy. So if you, it's, it's just like structuring a, a PhD thesis. And, and I suppose what I'd say to you, have you enjoyed it? Because yes. obviously you know, the, from the thesis, you could have ended up you know, in a classroom. She's a magnificent teacher. She taught for me. I mean, just an incredible teacher, amazing teacher. You could have ended up doing that, but you've chosen this path, yes. or the path has chosen you. Has that been a good, a good decision for yes. you? Yes, it has been a very good decision. Um, I, I love the research component, as I've said. I like the writing. I'm very fortunate. Um, my, um, my manager, hi Tim, is very supportive of, of where we want to go with the different projects that we pick and the first project that um, that I um, undertook and I'm still working on it at the moment is the cultural collections um, 
policy. So he knew that I was interested in GLAM, and so I got these five policies that I'm looking at, and I will produce um, one robust policy for cultural collections for UWA. And can I say, for, so it's a group of eight, can I say the, the cultural collections at the University of Western Australia are majestic. They are astounding and so valuable. Yes, um, the Burnt Museum of Anthropology holds the probably the world's most significant collection of um, indigenous um, cultural material um, and also um, material, uh, cultural material from Southeast Asia and um, through other parts of, of Asia. So they are a very, uh, that's a very significant um, collection, yes. Now, I didn't know that would be our lead-in, but we have talked a lot about glams, and you know, Deb w was was always interested in the public dissemination of her research. She never wanted her research to stay in a thesis or in a library. It was about rendering it public and fonts of conversation and fonts of challenge and change. So you work a lot with the glams. Explain it to my students. What, what's the benefit of an academic, a scholar, a PhD student, post-PhD student doing that work with galleries, libraries, archives and museums? We're the, the custodians of um, cultural material, of um, artefacts, of um, artworks. And when you look at those, uh, those um, materials, they are really significant research and teaching materials. Um, okay, that people go along to museums and they have a look at them in the galleries and all the rest of it. One of the best experiences that I've had was at the British Museum last year. They had a touch table and you could actually hold um, objects from their collection. And one of the, the objects that I held was a... Um, ancient Egyptian uh, perfume vase. Uh, so they are actually, and that inspires students that, that yeah. really, who are interested in that. But also, if you're interested in, if your interests are sport, there's a wonderful, there's wonderful sports museums around the world. Um, there's the Football Museum in Manchester. Uh, there's a, a the Football Museum and Sports Museum um, at um, in Melbourne. Yes. So the museums and galleries they hold something for everybody. Yeah. There's there's interests, and um, they're also they're a wonderful window to the past. Now I'm thinking of of artworks. So um, Lowry's work, Lowry, Lowry. Um, his work is of everyday people. But you also look at the um, the Dutch masters. They also did a lot of, of paintings of everyday people. Then, so the the artworks from you know past centuries doesn't have to be a king or a queen's portrait. It is actually a snapshot of of everyday life there. If you look into the background of the Mona Lisa, you'll see what the Tuscan landscape looked like then. So um, these, you know, glams are really, really important, to, important to me anyway. And, and Deb's work really worked very strongly, particularly with sport, because that's where Deb's work started. So sport and art, sport and architecture, sport and archives. And because you were obsessed by, and of course Steve loved you for this, you're obsessed by stopping people doing this binary opposition of, you know, here's high cultural bourgeois art and here's low grade sport. That Deb very much was doing the good, and I'm using this word postmodern correctly because you were critiquing grand narratives. So it was the postmodern project of flattening the hierarchies and building new relationships. Look, the, the, the connection between sport and art is like this. Yeah. Um, you there is the, um, paintings around and, and illustrations around sporting events. Sydney Nolan has uh, a painting of Australian rules football. There are other um, paintings of Australian rules yeah. football. Um, sport films, sport, sport, sport and television, sport, sport and social media, uh, music. Up where Kazali. Um, 
and literature, the whole the whole lot. I don't see that sport and um, and art are separate. I, I see them as being enmeshed. And I owe Deb so much for so many thousands of, of things, but of course I wrote the book Playing on the Periphery, which I think was published in 2008, which now open access, you can get it for free if you so choose. But it was your courage in seeing those relationships and movements that became the basis of that book because it was very much looking at museums and galleries and archives for sport and how how that actually transforms, particularly post-colonial sport, yes. so non-English sport, how we manage sport on the edges. Yes, yes. And um, when I have um, spent a bit of time um, overseas in Indonesia, um, I've actually taken notice of uh, their sport as well. So um, I've got a few anecdotes about that uh, for another time. For another time, which we, we will bring her back for this, because it is my last question, Deb, and I always, uh, when I have an inspirational person with me, and my God, you are, girl, what would you say to all the remarkable men and women out there who are watching this and are in a successful job like you were, and are thinking, you know what, I really would like to do a PhD. What would you say to them, Deb? Do it. Absolutely do it. Your, your life will be enriched um, by you doing it through the people that you meet, the things that you achieve, the skills that you acquire, and you won't ever be thinking, I should have. You will have done it. It is an achievement. I'm very fortunate in that I can see that my thesis had a measurable social impact but I'm sure that anybody else that's got the same ability and the same commitment that I have had can also do the same as I have. And the gumption. Uh, Deb, you know, I, I've, I've supervised, I think, we're at probably hundreds of PhD students at this point, but, but you know the great ones. And Deb, you've certainly, you've changed me. You were an inspiration for that incredible cohort at Murdoch University uh, where all those students were going through and and Deb was always with them, with the energy, with the passion, with the commitment and with the push. And you know, you have always had this propulsive need to learn and think and create a commitment to excellence, but also the courage and the gumption is absolutely stunning. So Deb, thank you for sparing you. an hour of your trip to Adelaide for our conversation thank today. You. I adore you. Thank you, and it's reciprocal. I love you very much. Um, I wish you all love, light and peace from Deb and Tara. Hi. Oh. Is that okay? You are. You are.